Uh, my name is Gautam Malhotra. This is uh, Introduction to Lower Limb Amputee Rehabilitation and Prosthetic Management. I got to tell you, when I was a resident, uh, prosthetics was one of the tougher topics for me. I just couldn't get it. Uh, I didn't know um, uh, the componentry. I couldn't understand it. I couldn't, uh, you, one attending even said it might not be <laughs> for me. Uh, so this lecture happened after I was an attending and worked side by side with a prosthetist and started to really understand it. And I think, um, you know, in my 17 years at the VA, I was one of the main guys that uh, was taking care of uh, amputees and prosthetics. I was even the liaison for the uh, amputee system of care to the national office. So I'm really into it. I really like it. And this was my way of trying to explain it. Um, to a starting out resident uh, in physical medicine and rehab. Uh, I start off with this slide, uh, which is a uh, quote from Bradham's textbook of rehabilitation medicine. Lower limb amputation remains one of the classic rehabilitation diagnoses amenable to intervention by a physiatrist. Rehabilitation and prosthetic interventions offer tremendous potential for improvement of amputee physical functioning emotional well-being, and quality of life. And administering treatment to this population is profoundly rewarding. That says it all. Uh, I think it's important to go through the history of medicine as it relates to amputation because basically people weren't surviving their amputations. Um, Hippocrates does describe surgical amputations as far back as 460 BC. Uh, and then as uh, military surgeons uh, had to use it, ligation technique, tourniquet, antiseptic techniques, the ability to stop infections and anesthetics, all of these kind of made the process of amputating someone and letting them survive it uh, more reasonable. As the population is aging, the number of amputations in persons older than 65 years is expected to double. Amputation prevalence is also expected to more than double from these numbers was 2005 to 2050. Most amputations in America are due to dysvascular and infectious complications, being diabetic, on dialysis, or having a more proximal amputation decreases chances of surviving an amputation. Other causes include trauma, tumors, and congenital defects. We all know how bad smoking and hypertension are for vascular health, but actually diabetes is worse. Uh, they, diabetics have decreased survival rates and higher rates of amputation. So uh, an easy, quick thing you can memorize is that prognosis uh, seems to be worse if you're elderly or dysvascular. And the opposite is true. It's better prognosis if you're young and you've had a traumatic amputation rather than a dysvascular cause. And uh, another uh, quick point is the contralateral foot should be consistently monitored no matter the cause of the amputation. I think for most of you, our role seems pretty obvious. We admit and rehabilitate patients, amputees, then we help them get and adjust to getting uh, and using a prosthesis. Most will benefit from seeing us annually to address and prevent issues thereafter. But we can also be important uh, clinical contributors prior to amputation. I talk to patients that are seeing me for other issues about their vascular disease all the time. We can also help just prior to amputation and when they are in acute care. Beyond patient comfort, adequate perioperative pain control minimizes the patient's stress and allows the patient to participate more fully in a rehabilitation program. Uncontrolled pain can result in the development of central nervous system mediated pain and chronic pain as well as it can impair post-operative healing and immune functions. We can address fear of the unknown by describing, describing the rehab, describing the prostheses, and connecting them with their peer groups. We also want to preoperatively discuss phantom limb sensation and phantom limb pain with patients before surgery. Phantom limb sensation is the temporary uh, non-painful feeling that the amputated limb is still present, which typically fades away over a period of weeks. Phantom pain is the usually temporary pain that can occur in the amputated portion of a limb after its amputation, especially in a patient with a long history of pre-amputation limb pain. 
All patients need to be told to expect these sensations in the missing limb after surgery and to realize that they are normal. We also can get them working out before amputation to prep them for the surgery. So this is all the pre-amputation stuff that we can do as physiatrists. So is amputation medical failure or a restorative reconstruction process? Either way, you might advise the surgeon on amputation level based on the prosthetic and cosmetic consequences. Even though the surgeon will probably make the decision independently, it's good for you to know how high we can amputate. Obviously, we don't want to keep dead tissue that can't heal. The surgeon has to make many thing, take many things into consideration in picking the level. On your boards, they're going to ask you about transcutaneous oximetry, ankle brachial index, a couple of other things. After completely removing the dead tissue, the doctor may decide to suture or close the flaps immediately if there's minimal risk of infection. Otherwise, leaving it open, the skin will remain drawn back from the amputation site for several days so any infected tissue can be cleaned off. At a later time, once the stump tissue is clean and free of infection, the skin flaps can be sutured back together to close the wound. A guillotine amputation is a heroic effort to prevent infection from killing someone. This will later be modified to a closed uh, amputation. During the amputation, freed up muscles can either be directly sutured to bone, which is called myodesis, or they can be sutured to other muscles, which is called myoplasty. Myodesis is a little more challenging, but it gives you more stability. Love these pictures I found on the internet. We didn't have these pictures when I was in a residency. Here you can see the uh, fish mouth uh, incision. Uh, here's the muscle. Uh, here's the uh, fascia, adipose tissue, and skin. And then you see that they're sewing the muscle into the bone or into tendon and then closing it up. That's going to be real stable, uh, but it needs good tissue, young, healthy tissue to be able to um, heal as well as uh, a myoplasty would. Myoplasty is easier and it allows the muscles to kind of flop around a bit more. But this is preferred for our dysvascular patients. See here, you got the uh, muscle going uh, sutured into muscle. We don't like fitting an amputee with a prosthesis when there are wounds. So we do everything we can to expedite healing. Nutrition is very important as are physically addressing the wound. So uh, reducing post-surgical edema is Im important to promote wound healing and to minimize post-op pain and shape the limb for prosthetic fitting. Post-op edema stretches uh, a surgical wound which stretches nerve endings and causes pain. Edema puts tension on the wound, compromising healing. And the swelling that occurs uh, gives it a bulbous shape uh, to the residual limb which interferes with prosthetic fitting and can slow the patient's functional recovery. Mm -hmm. So an effective uh, compressive dressing can minimize these problems. And there are uh, several uh, edema control systems available. Although ACE wraps, oops, although ACE wraps can provide um, effective compression, they're, they are high maintenance items and they have to be properly applied and changed about every four to six hours to maintain consistent compression. This can be difficult and time consuming for a patient uh, or even the healthcare team to accomplish. You could use elastic socks or stockinettes. These may or may not be a better um, option or alternative. Um, they're also known as tube grip or compressor grip, and they can be applied in layers um, to give a graded and increased compression toward the end of the residual limb. They are inexpensive, they're easily applied. Um, you can also do pre manufactured uh, residual limb shrinkers, and um, that's really what I ended up going with toward the end. The A straps were kind of what the uh, textbook said, but um, for some reason, uh, the technology of the shrinkers had gotten so much better that they were doing a better job uh, in my population than um, the ace wrapping, um, even when it was done perfectly every couple hours. So if you do use uh, a, a shrinker for a transfemoral amputee, uh, it usually needs a waist belt uh, because otherwise the dressing tends to slide off the conical shaped residual limb. and um, it has to be applied to the side of the limb, um, otherwise it will fall off during sitting. Uh, elastomeric liners can also be used as compression socks, 
the elastomeric liners I'm talking about here are the ones that um, uh, might be a sleeve uh, placed on the um, amputee when they're going to put on their prosthesis. So yeah, these can also uh, be used as shrinkers. Um, but anyway, you have to look for uh, bony prominences to be closely monitored because um, pressure can concentrate at the protruding bony areas and lead to skin breakdown. Uh, another uh, category of um, post-op edema control is rigid dressings. So you can have non-removable and uh, removable dressings. So non-removable -remo are uh, great because you could use them um, immediately post-op. So we'll talk about immediate post-operative prosthesis in a moment. Um, and it's basically a cast. Uh, and you can, uh, they'll be great for preventing and minimizing edema. Um, and they can be uh, conformed to minimize pressure over the bony prominences like I was talking about. They're really good for protection. You can even start partial weight bearing uh, through the rigid dressing to help desensitize the limb and build uh, tolerance to pressure. Problem with the non-removable is that you can't inspect the limb in case you want to do uh, wound care unless you're um, removing and, and, and replacing the dressing at that time. Um, but with a removable rigid dressing, you can inspect and do, you know, massage for desensitization. I did try using these removable rigid dressings, but the amount of work that it takes um, just didn't seem worth it. After a certain point, uh, the limb shrinks and um, you need to put a new one on. So it's better to just, uh, for me, just to use a shrinker. There's plenty of protocols for that. And just overall, um, the prosthetists learn that the goal of the shaping is an eventual circumference difference of approximately a half inch between the mid patellar tendon to the distal end. And that's for, um, that's for uh, below knee amputees. Early rehabilitation management is critical in the post-op period. Hopefully the rehab team has been involved already, but if not, consultation with physiatry and involvement of physical therapy and occupational therapy should begin as soon as possible. Therapy staff work on a variety of areas, such as self-care, bed mobility, transfers, wheelchair skills, ambulation, and patient and family teaching. Amputee rehab principles include proper positioning, initiation of range of motion, early mobilization, and evaluation for durable medical equipment and adaptive devices. So let's get into some of that. Patients should be educated in proper positioning to prevent hip and knee contractures, and that's critical in this period. So avoid placing pillows under the knee or between the legs because this can lead to knee flexion and hip abduction contractures, respectively. Dangling the residual limb over the side of the bed or wheelchair should be avoided, and they're all going to naturally do it. So we give them a knee extension board or a Gerber support is what we call it. We put that underneath uh, the wheelchair cushion to promote knee extension and help prevent uh, dependent edema. Wheelchair elevating leg rests are generally less effective. They're more expensive than these boards. They just don't work. You could use a knee immobilizer um, if you think they really are uh, high risk for compression. Um, prone lying several times a day for 10 to 15 minutes at a time to prevent hip flexion contractures is um, necessary for both levels. Range of motion and strengthening exercise of most of the muscles that oppose the common sites of contracture and upper body training prepares patients to properly execute transfers and to correctly use um, crutches or a walker. You may even want to do aerobic exercise to increase endurance and cardiovascular fitness with attention to whatever cardiac comorbidities they might have. Early mobilization and, uh, will facilitate early functional improvements, including bed mobility, transfers, and mobilization to a chair or a wheelchair, progressing to standing and balance exercises in parallel bars and hopping, and the use of a walker or crutches would be the next step in mobilization. And they may, you know, fly through this or it may take them a while. Um, and then adaptive equipment uh, and durable medical equipment is important as well. We use uh, long-handled mirrors and teach them how to uh, self-monitor the status of their residual limb so that they can report any issues. Because sitting in a wheelchair makes the amputee center of gravity tight, uh, higher and more posterior, the rear wheels should be set posterior to the chair back 
and anti-tippers should be placed to minimize the risk of tipping backwards and sustaining a head injury. This is particularly important for transfemoral and bilateral amputees, and this is a board question every year. The acute post-operative period prepares the patient for a safe return home with the temporary assistance of a wheelchair, walker, crutches, or with an early fitted prosthesis. But you have to have a plan for ongoing rehab services during the post-op period. Younger patients might be discharged home fairly quickly uh, with crutch ambulators uh, and ongoing outpatient rehab, but the older and um, marginally functioning patients or multi-limb amputees uh, will need acute inpatient rehab before they can safely return home. These patients can generally be admitted to a, a unit between post-op days three through seven after any drains are removed. Pain is under relative control with oral medications and they have the endurance to participate in a comprehensive rehab program. They need to be followed up closely thereafter for 12 to 18 months. Um, you know, the focus has been on wound healing, edema control, psychological adjustment, pain control. Prosthetic fitting and prosthetic gait training can usually start within three to six weeks of surgery. It's really up to the surgeon uh, to clear them. Some of the surgeons uh, really don't care when you start, but most of them want the wound to be um, stable. And patients usually are able to independent, independently ambulate or with an assistive device within a month of starting therapy with their prosthesis. The residual limb continues to shrink during the first six to eight months, and it requires constant monitoring to uh, make sure that there's adequate fit of the device. And after shrinkage uh, ends in six to eight months, the patient can then be fit, fitted with a new definitive prosthesis, or at least with a new socket, and we'll talk about that later. But that's pretty much everything for the rehab. Identifying uh, the cause of post-operative limb pain is important for successful control of the pain. Uh, nerve fiber damage and ongoing stimulation of the nerves in the residual limb um, is you know going to expectedly cause uh, pain secondary to the incision and post-operative edema. Ectopic activity at the cut end of the nerves is expected and can be due to unstable sodium channels or the uncovering of new pathologic receptors. And then there's efaptic transmission, which is um, the stimulation of afferent fibers or nociceptors by efferent neurons, which are the motor or sympathetics, and that can also contribute to limb pain. And this acute uh, pain responds well to IV or IM opiates. Um, it subsides fairly rapidly, and um, you can usually stop those within two days, two to three days. Uh, scheduled doses of oral opiates with rescue medications as needed should be continued beyond this period, and they can be weaned slowly so that the patient continues to receive adequate pain control. Desensitization techniques can be added to the treatment plan within a few days of surgeries. They get instructed to start massaging and tapping the residual limb, and this can be performed through a soft dressing as well. And this gives the patient a technique for controlling their pain independently. Self-massage also forces the patient to attend to their amputation, and this can help with their new body image and psychological adjustment to limb loss. If the pain doesn't subside as expected, you gotta look for another reason. It could be, especially in a uh, dysvascular patient, it could be that um, they're still having continued limb uh, ischemia, and that could be basically claudication that they're feeling. Wound infection and abscess should also be uh, looked for. Um, if it is a dysvascular claudication, uh, they may need reamputation at a higher level. Um, and that you can also sometimes see that tissue necrosis is progressing, wound is failing to heal, and that's why they have the ischemic pain. So um, if you are gonna be reamputating, that's a discussion to have, as well as um, you're gonna need ongoing pain management in the interim. Even after the immediate post-op period, residual limb healing, uh, the incidence of pain is high in patients with amputation, about 68% reporting residual limb pain and 80% reporting phantom pain. The most common types of sensory problems uh, reported include phantom pain and phantom sensation and residual limb pain. The differentials for these are diverse and treatment options differ based on the etiology of the pain. So you have to get good at identifying what the issue is. I think it's very important um, I, uh, what the context and advice that uh, the clinical team gives. So if you tell the patient that 
phantom sensation is normal and it can actually be helpful uh, in um, acclimating to a new prosthesis, um, then they accept it. Phantom pain, it's important to let them know that this is probably temporary and it's going to get better over time. The character of phantom limb pain is often described as sharp, burning, stabbing, tingling, shooting, electric, uh, cramping, and it may be similar to the pain that they had before the amputation. Um, they may feel they have uh, a painful foot ulcer, and that's what their phantom pain is. Uh, so it's kind of almost like a memory of what they had before. First line of treatment for bothersome phantom uh, pain is uh, uh, desensitization techniques, massaging, tapping, slapping, wrapping, and friction rubbing. Um, usually the um, occupational therapist or physical therapist is the one teaching them these. Um, many find that for a phantom itch, scratching the remaining leg in the same spot is helpful. And uh, under hypnosis, the patient might be able to alleviate a cramped phantom hand or move an awkwardly uh, phantom positioned limb to a more comfortable place uh, or position. But if desensitization uh, techniques um, are insufficient or they're significantly interfering with the uh, functional recovery, um, there are tons of different things that you can try, but it's not necessarily clear that one uh, treatment is uh, better than the other. Um, you know, there's uh, the antidepressants, um, but, and they can also be used to treat depression which is a common problem in neuroamputees, so you may want to uh, target that way. They also have anxiolytic effects, um, but some are sedating, so you have to you know, t time the doses so that maybe it's right before they go to sleep. Um, and then there's you know, all sorts of stuff in terms of serotonin, and you guys probably know the pain stuff better than I do, uh, anticonvulsants. Um, we can move on, though, to uh, non-pharmacological treatments, such as um, stress relaxation techniques and biofeedback. TENS stimulation has also given temporary relief. Mirror therapy, um, which can kind of be used to unwind a uh, hand, like I said before. Um, you can look to see if maybe there might be a neuroma there, which is a bundle of nerve endings that form after a nerve is cut. Um, as is done after uh, amputation. These will produce sharp focal pain under pressure or with palpation. You could tenels it. If you do see it um, superficially, it can cause significant pain and preclude the use of a prosthesis. Uh, the socket adjustments can usually help with that, but if not, then people try um, uh, you know, steroid injections, anesthetic injections, or even ablation with phenol, alcohol, or cryoablation to provide pain relief. Um, the literature is a, a little mixed in terms of how beneficial these are. Um, so if you're not typically doing these, I wouldn't recommend them. The emotional impact of limb loss is devastating and is frequently underestimated by the rehab team. Grieving over the loss of one's limb is necessary and a brief reactive depression is uh, anticipated Amputees are at high risk of developing more severe psychological problems with up to a third persisting with clinical depression. Risk factors for depression include low income, comorbid conditions, and the presence of phantom and back pain. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a recognized complication after traumatic amputation, but frequently goes untreated, while non-traumatic amputees can also develop anxiety disorders from the stress related to limb loss. The team can encourage uh, the patient by talking about prognosis, providing educational materials, and incorporating the patient's specific goals into the rehab plan. Uh, emphasize the gains made in therapy. Start discussing prosthetic options um, with, uh, early on with their input in the decision-making process, and that'll empower them and give them a sense of control. Peer counseling and amputee support groups offer an opportunity to talk to persons who have already had a similar amputation and then they get to see how well they're doing. It can be very valuable to the patient. The Amputee Coalition of America has a national peer network that provides peer counselor training sessions and lists amputee support groups by region. I definitely recommend that you look into that if you're starting a new team. And you, the physician, should regularly monitor their emotional adjustment to amputation by assessing mood, appetite, weight changes, quality of sleep, you know, they may report nightmares, 
and issues may not surface until the shock and denial wear off and time is passing. Uh, incidence of depression, incidentally, is in younger amputees increases with time. Ideally, you've got a psychologist on your team and they can do an assessment of mood, pain, uh, other stressors, coping skills, past psychological problems, substance abuse or substance use, body image issues, and sexuality. Uh, if clinical depression, anxiety disorders, or adjustment disorders are identified, a comprehensive treatment plan should be initiated with cognitive behavioral psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy as needed. Plus, if the team knows about this, then they can also be sensitive to these issues. Skin issues uh, abound in uh, amputees. Um, the most common issue you see is ulceration caused by excessive pressure, shear, or both. The most common places for pressure sores are over bony prominences and at the brim of the socket. So patients might not be donning their prostheses correctly, there might be wrinkles in the socks and liners, or there may be too many sock ply. These can all cause excessive pressure. Insufficient sock ply can lead to pistoning, which is the up and down movement in the socket. Uh, they can also have bottoming out uh, of, on the bone as well as excessive shear. So socket fit is clearly important and pressure sensitive areas need to have adequate reliefs in the socket by the prosthetist. The, so the suspension system uh, has to be adequate to prevent the pistoning and rotational shear and socket brims need to be rounded adequately in problematic areas so that they're not causing excessive pressure on soft tissues. Finally, you have to look at the way the patient is uh, walking and the biomechanics because poor gait mechanics can lead to excessive pressures and shears causing skin ulceration. Uh, you probably want to avoid bulky wound dressings because they can put additional pressure on the ulcer when the limb is in the prosthesis. Transparent film dressings and elastomeric liners can reduce the shear. And if wounds are large uh, and not responding to um, initial treatments, I just have them decrease how long they're wearing their prosthesis. In refractory cases, a change to a different type of socket or suspension system might need to be considered. Contact dermatitis is inflammation of the skin. Contact dermatitis is inflammation of the skin manifested by redness and sometimes edema. Uh, it can be caused by anything that irritates, uh, causing scaling or an allergic reaction, causing vesiculation. It's a common problem, especially with prosthetic limbs um, and especially with the increased use of uh, elastomeric liners. It's treated by locating the causative agent and preventing it from contacting the residual limb. Hygiene of the residual limb is probably the first thing you want to start with. Uh, and then you can think about things like, um, you know, what could be causing it. So soaps can be a causative agent. So you should wash the residual limb each night with a mild uh, or a hypoallergenic soap and then rinse the limb really well so that there's no soap left on there. You have to also maybe consider um, a different interface system. So there's different materials that can be used in these gel liners and they should be washed uh, daily. Uh, really, um, things like topical steroids will decrease inflammation and discomfort, but that's not um, a solution. What you really, it's not a long-term plan. You really have to find what the causative agent is and eliminate it. Uh, another issue is hyperhidrosis. Actually, it's quite common. Uh, almost uh, a third to a half of patients will report this as a symptom, uh, at least in one study. And it's usually associated with the prosthetic use and can be seen with all types of suspension and liner materials because heat dissipation is impaired with the use of the prosthetic device or the material over the residual limb. You could use nylon sheaths for wicking um, or you can use topical uh, or spray antiperspirants. Uh, one series showed promise with the use of Botox for alleviating this symptom, but that requires a technique or a technical skill uh, to perform it. Um, we can also talk about infections. Uh, for a very long time in uh, PMNR, you get quite good at dealing with wounds. Uh, I think what's uh, relevant here is the fungal infections that can occur later on uh, when they're outpatients because of the tendency to perspire. And so you can use topical agents uh, such as ketoconazole um, or terbinafine, uh, which has a shorter treatment duration. Uh, once the infection is resolved, cornstarch, unscented talc, antiperspirant agents without a deodorant. These can help with prevention of recurrence. Uh, prescription strength uh, antiperspirants are available. We use them all the time. 
and um, altering or limiting the use of the prosthesis until the infections are resolved or um, to stop draining will probably be a good idea as well. Verruca's hyperplasia, always a board question. That's the development of a wart-like lesion on the end of the residual limb. Uh, it looks like cracks in the skin and you can even get infection occurring in severe cases. It's the most common, um, or it's most, most common in transtibial amputees, but it can occur at other levels. It's a dysplastic skin condition thought to be due to a, chokes, a choking effect on the residual limb. So what it is, is you have the residual limb here, you have the socket here, and instead of making perfect total contact, you get excessive pressure proximally and less so distally. So what that does is it causes enough pressure that the venous um, pressure is not enough to overcome it, but the arterial is. So uh, blood starts pooling over there and it starts to develop that choke syndrome and eventually that leads to this uh, skin issue. Um, it's really actually not known what the pathophysiology is, but adjusting the prosthesis to create adequate distal pressure usually resolves the Baruchus hyperplasia within a few weeks or months. Um, so adjustments can be made like adding an end pad to the socket. Uh, otherwise, you have to make a brand new uh, socket. Epidermoid cysts, um, they occur when the sebaceous glands are plugged up. They're firm, round, mobile, subcutaneous nodules of variable size that are most commonly found in the popliteal fossa of trans-tib amputees and the upper thigh of transfemoral amputees. They can be quite tender and they can become inflamed by the pressure of the prosthesis. Uh, treatment uh, really is about minimizing pressure over the cyst by adjusting the prosthesis and ensuring optimal fit. Um, you could use topical or oral antifungals, um, antibacterial agents. Sometimes the larger inflamed cysts require incision and drainage. Recurrences are frequent though because incision and draining doesn't remove the keratin producing lining of the cyst. So a more definitive treatment would be surgical excision, but even this doesn't completely eliminate the possibility of recurrence. So we talked about all the preoperative and perioperative and even postoperative rehab issues related to the amputee. It's really hard to know where to put this topic. This is called an immediate post-op prosthesis. And what it is is that during the surgery or after the surgery or immediately after the surgery, uh, the surgeon can um, apply this uh, prosthesis for um, potentially getting the patient to ambulate earlier. Um, the facilities who have published research with it have shown possibly less complications, earlier re uh, ambulation. However, you really have to have the surgeon, the prosthetist, the rehab team have to all be working interdisciplinarily um, to really be monitoring the wound and the progress of the patient. Um, I don't think typically that this is a management strategy that is accepted out there, uh, but it's something you should know about, the IPOP. So now we can move on to um, the uh, amputee and the amputation levels. So this uh, slide shows you basically what we're going to go over. Uh, we're going to start uh, distally and move more proximally. So you have the foot ankle um, or a partial foot uh, amputation. So you start at most distally with a toe um, that can be partial or disarticulated. Disarticulation means that the two bones have been separated at a joint rather than cutting through the bone. You can have a ray resection. We're going to talk about that in more detail. Transmetatarsal, where you're going through the metatarsals. Here you can see that here. Uh, the Lisfranc, which is a disarticulation, uh, as is the show part. Uh, then you have the Boyd and Pirogoff. Uh, where you're cutting through the calcaneus, and then you have what's called an ankle disarticulation. We're going to go through that. And then uh, more proximally, you have the BKA, transtibial, knee disarticulation, transfemoral or AKA, hip disarticulation, hemipelvectomy, and eventually uh, cutting half the body off, hemicorporectomy. So let's go through these. So a toe amputation uh, can be either the great toe or any of the other toes. The great toe will uh, cause more functional uh, issues. Um, as soon as you cut through the metatarsal, then I believe that's when you can start calling it a ray uh, amputation. Um, I've seen ray amputations where they take the toe 
and the metatarsal off or they cut through the metatarsal. Only way to know what they've done is to actually look at an x-ray. And as we move proximally, you can cut through all the metatarsals and that gives you a transmetatarsal amputation or a TMA. Um, as we move more proximally, you can disarticulate the, the metatarsals from the tarsals. So that would be a metatarsotarsal disarticulation or lis franc amputation. Um, as we go more proximally, you can disarticulate uh, some of the tarsals from the other tarsals. So it's a tarsotarsal disarticulation where you're leaving the talus and the calcaneus in place. That's the uh, subtalar joint uh, where pronation and uh, supination occur. So what's important here is the more proximal you're going, the less of the dorsiflexors, um, dorsiflexor attachments you're keeping. Um, the tibialis anterior has two basic attachment sites, which um, the show part, you've pretty much uh, lost most of your um, strength. And as you can imagine, there's unopposed plantar flexors. So uh, eventually a show part is going to develop a plantar flexion contracture unless you're doing something actively to stop that from happening. So one... Um, way that we used in residency to memorize this is smart boys chop less toes. Smart boys chop less toes. Symes, Boyd, Chopart, Lisfranc, uh, TMA, Toe, and Ray. Okay, so let's go through these distal to proximal. We just showed you what a uh, toe and a ray amputation are and a TMA. We talked about the Lisfranc and we talked about the Chopart. A Boyd is when uh, we cut through the uh, calcaneus, retaining a part of the calcaneus uh, and the fat pad and the skin and bring that up where we cut through. This is showing a disarticulation, but actually they cut through the malleoli um, at the tibia and the fibula. Uh, and then they bring that up, attach it, and now you have a distal weight-bearing limb. That would be the Boyd or Perigoff. I have not seen one of these ever in my career. I don't think surgeons are doing these. What is more common is the Symes amputation. Symes amputation is the same thing. They cut through the malleoli, but instead of retaining the calcaneus, they just bring the fat pad up, and yes, you have a distal weight-bearing limb. So these are pictures. You can see a toe amputation. Here you see um, all the rays removed except the big toe. Uh, here you can see them cutting through it, um, and then after they've sewn it up with the drain. And here's what a symes looks like uh, after they're done with it, with that bulbous distal end. So let's go more proximally. Uh, transtibial amputation, you see these descriptions of long, medium, short, very short. There's no good definition of these, you just eyeball it, basically. In order to be a BK, you basically need um, to have attachment of the patellar tendon at the tibial tuberosity. Um, if you have that, then you have a functional knee that can extend and flex, although the longer this lever arm, the better the function will be. You can see here they've done a fish mouth uh, incision and then they bring it up over here and you get the incision um, uh, scar being more anterior. There are other less typical um, versions of the BK. For example, uh, there's the Ertl, uh, the, the guillotine, um, and the gritty stokes. So this is the gritty stokes. They cut a piece of the femur. Um, they disarticulate the tibia from the femur. They take the patella off of here and put it on the distal weight, uh, distal end so that perhaps it has better uh, weight bearing uh, properties. Uh, for the urtle, um, they take a piece of bone and they create a bridge over there. Transfemoral amputations are uh, going up further where now you no longer have a knee joint functionally. Um, I've given you a whole bunch of uh, details in here. Uh, main thing is that you are cutting through all the adductors um, and this uh, leads to the unusual situation in rehab of abduction contracture if uh, not uh, specifically addressed. Um, just know that you're also cutting through the sciatic nerve. You can develop a neuroma there. There's a whole giant neurovascular uh, bundle, uh, and there's a whole lot to know about um, management of the post-op transfemoral amputee. 
as we go more proximally, uh, you can cut through um, the femur proximally, um, retaining the ball and socket. Uh, and um, you can also just completely disarticulate the uh, femur from the acetabulum, the, the ball and socket. So the advantages to this modified hip disarticulation is that you still have um, a piece here that can eventually later, you know, we're developing new techniques where you may be able to osseo integrate a prosthesis into there, meaning connect it directly to there. Also when sitting, maybe this offers a little bit more stability than this does. If you do actually cut through the pelvis, you know, maybe there's a tumor there or maybe there's some kind of trauma that can't be recovered from, that's called uh, a hemipelvectomy. And if, uh, you know, there's a, a situation where a heroic effort needs to be made to save a life in the face of severe trauma, infection, or cancer, you can perform what's called a hemicorporectomy. Um, you're going to need multiple surgeons to perform this and um, because there's large fluid shifts and you know the bowel, the bladder, everything has to be redirected and there's been uh, good outcomes with this. I have a story for you later. So this is a uh, review of all the different levels um, for later review. So this is a really important slide and uh, I'd like you to not move on from this until you've memorized it. Um, the cost, uh, the energy cost, the metabolic cost um, of amputation when walking um, kind of dictates how everything happens functionally later. So let's look at some uh, studies that are all put together in one slide here for you. So as you can see here, let me just get this going here. Um, so this is, would be a uh, a non-amputated uh, person walking, transtibial or BK, knee disarticulation, transfemoral uh, or AKA, hip disarticulation, and hemipelvectomy. So when measuring the actual uh, metabolic uh, energy use when walking at the same speed, you'll see that it increases the higher up you go with your amputation. Makes sense. But if you let everyone walk at their own chosen walking speed, you'll see that they all walk at about the same metabolic cost, which means that the higher up you go, they're walking at a slower speed. So that's the chosen walking speed will then decrease so that they use the same uh, metabolic energy uh, when walking. And then here you see that demonstrated that the speed is the same. So um, when you do actually a direct comparison of walking in unilateral amputees with and without a prosthesis utilizing a three-point uh, crutch assisted gait pattern it revealed that all, with the exception of uh, vascular transfemoral amputees, they all had a lower rate of energy expenditure, heart rate, and O2 cost when using a prosthesis. To me, this is all common sense, uh, but if it isn't for you yet, uh, you need to memorize this. Thus far, we really haven't talked about uh, prosthetic componentry. Uh, this lecture has been uh, kind of broken down into amputee stuff, um, and then prosthetic stuff. So this slide uh, really um, is about the amputee. What is their potential functional level? And uh, these are the uh, K levels that uh, uh, Medicare or CMS has um, put together. And these determine what they're going to pay for in, t in terms of prosthetic componentry. I know we haven't gotten to prosthetic componentry yet, but overall what it is is that about six to nine months after the amputation, the uh, residual limb or the stump stabilizes and um, they can be ready now for a new or definitive prosthesis or at least a new socket and different componentry can be considered. Um, you know, the first prosthesis can then be a backup prosthesis. 
and all amputees are going to require prosthetic gait training from an experienced physical therapist. They're going to train them to uh, independently don and doff the prosthesis, which means put it on and take it off, uh, to monitor their skin tolerance, to adjust the sock ply fitting as the residuum shrinks, and the training uh, will maximize the patient's function. The level of performance will vary with each patient, but community ambulation and the negoti negotiation of stairs and curbs are the goals for most patients. A floor to sit transfer should also be a goal for most patients uh, and may be overlooked. Uh, therapy does not need to stop with this level of performance. And for more active amputees continuing to work in therapy on vocational activities, running, biking, riding, or other athletic activities that they're into or recreational activities that they're into will um, be more advanced therapeutic goals for them. So these K levels, you have to be clear on each patient where, what their potential functional level is as justification for um, prescribing a certain prosthetic componentry. If you don't meet the criteria for that componentry, it won't get paid for. So I uh, didn't know where else to put this, but uh, there, there seems to be con some confusion on what to call the amputated limb. So uh, when I was a resident, uh, I was told to call it a residual limb. Uh, in the note, I will usually call it a residuum or residual limb. But the patient really didn't like <laughs> me using that word because they couldn't tell whether I was talking about their other limb, their good limb, their sound limb, their normal limb, their unaffected limb, or was I talking about the amputated limb? And so many of them just call it their stump. Uh, could be that in the VA, uh, the veterans prefer that while uh, the rest of the population doesn't. Uh, try and figure out what uh, your community likes. Also, um, should you use the word BKA, BAKA, transtibial, transformer, transforaminal, sorry, transfemoral. Um, I think most people are good with transtibial and transfemoral, uh, but again, know your patient. So now we're going to shift focus from uh, the amputee to the equipment and componentry. And what I did here is uh, give you the broad categories first, and then the subcategories, and then the details. So as you watch me talk about all this, let it kind of wash over you, and then go back and try to memorize every slide. So uh, a little bit of uh, terminology. Uh, the word prosthesis is basically something that replaces a part of the body. So you can have a prosthetic eye, a prosthetic heart valve, and then you can have a prosthetic limb. Um, an orthosis is something that's added to the body to protect, stabilize, or enhance biomechanical function, um, but it doesn't replace the body part. So when we're dealing with partial foot amputees, um, you remember the smart boys chop less toes, uh, we're usually putting something in the shoe, uh, and sometimes the shoe itself is modified as well. So this might be the one time you use the word prosthosis, although I haven't seen it used um, uh, in common parlance uh, clinically. So uh, these would be, you know, kind of added to the body, but also uh, replacing a body part. So depending on what's missing, you kind of want to fill that uh, in the shoe. So a shoe or toe filler. Um, now, if the great toe has been compromised, then you've lost toe break and you need to compensate for that. And so that's where the rocker bottom shoe comes in. The rocker bottom shoe does not offer plantar flexion. It just aids in rollover. So that toe break that I was telling you about. Um, so some combination of shoe filler, toe filler, shoe modification, and ankle foot orthoses or AFOs is what we use for the partial foot. Just a little semantics. Um, now we're going to just talk about uh, prosthetic componentry. So the word prosthesis is the noun. Prosthetic is the adjective. 
So you can have a prosthetic limb or it's the patient's prosthesis. It's not the patient's prosthetic. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you're a geek like me, that matters to you. And the person who actually designs, fabricates, and fits the prosthesis is called a prosthetist. So whenever dealing with a prosthesis, a limb prosthesis, um, we're looking at these components, socket, these categories of components, sockets, suspensions, construction, and if there are joints and feet. So socket is anything that interfaces between the amputee and the prosthesis. Suspension is how it stays on. So sometimes the socket and the suspension are the same thing, but it's important to realize that these are two different functions. The construction, um, it depends on whether it's a shell or basically a rod. And then we'll talk about uh, knees and foot ankles uh, separately. So memorize these categories, and now we're going to uh, go into each of these categories for you. So construction is probably the easiest one to memorize. Uh, there's endoskeletal and there's exoskeletal. So as you can see here, this is basically um, a big pylon. There's a knee here, but, you know, like a pole. And here also you see a uh, pole or pylon. Uh, so this is endoskeletal. Now you do see here that there's a foam uh, shell around there. That's just for cosmesis. But the construction here is endoskeletal. Whereas here, the, this whole shell is made out of a rigid substance and there is no pole. This is called exoskeletal. Uh, here's another version of exoskeletal. Here again is endoskeletal. So the majority you see are going to be endoskeletal. The majority that you prescribe are going to be endoskeletal. Uh, I had a mnemonic for who you use exoskeletals for. The exoskeletals are for people who need more durability. So children put their uh, prosthesis through a little bit more. Uh, people who may not be as um, cognitively reliable. Uh, construction workers, people who are like really uh, occupationally putting their prosthesis through more need more durability and people who are too obese uh, and would overwhelm the pylon. So kids, crazies, construction, and Krispy Kreme was how I memorized it. Um, the benefit to the endoskeletal is that it's lighter and that it's adjustable. The exoskeletal, heavier, not adjustable. So this is why we usually um, default to the endoskeletal. I've spent a lot of time with prosthetists just trying to understand what they actually do. So um, I've put a few slides in here about how they actually make their sockets. Remember, the socket is the interface between the amputee and the prosthesis. So I've uh, put a link here for a YouTube video uh, that shows uh, the prosthetist doing a plaster uh, wrap um, to create uh, basically the shell that they use to make their, um, th that's the negative that they use to make the positive so that they can then make the socket. So traditionally, the prosthetist uses a plaster wrap to define the shape of the remaining limb. The typical plaster wrap results in a shell that's almost circular in cross-section throughout most of its length. When the shell is filled with plaster, the prosthetist modifies the resulting positive model before creating a socket over it by laminating or thermoforming uh, plastic. The prosthetist then adds extra plaster to the model to create space in the socket to, ac to accommodate bony prominences and, remove, and removes the plaster to tighten it up the fit. The experienced prosthetist can speed up the rectification process by contouring the original cast while it's setting. Another method of creating a socket is a computer-aided design and manufacturing. So that's called CAD CAM. This is instead of the uh, plaster socket. And it has been around since the 1980s. So for this method, the shape of the residual limb is captured using a scanner. The scanner is moved around the limb and a digital image immediately pulls up on a computer screen. The shape can be modified by the prosthetist, then it's sent to a central fabrication facility to manufacture a plastic 
test socket. For facilities with in-house carvers, the file can be sent to the carver. The carver uses a bit which moves in and out as well as up and down. And then the bit carves out the desired shape into a spinning blank piece of foam. A check socket is then fabricated over the modified foam model in the same way as a plaster model. Or it can be created with an automated thermoformer, thermoformer machine. The advantage of CAD CAM is that the digital file takes up virtually no space and can be pulled up again later if changes are made. Advocates for CAD CAM also say that it's faster than the traditional method, although I think this all depends on the comfort level of the prosthetist with the technology. Uh, when I was a resident, um, we faced a lot of different terminology in our different textbooks. So if you come across these, I just wanted to uh, help you uh, navigate them. Sometimes the um, material used for the socket can be described with these terms, flexible and rigid. So flexible indicates that you can do something to, uh, to change the shape of or change the change the material in some way after it's been fabricated. Uh, so usually this is some kind of thermoplastic. They have, the advantages are they have flexible walls. Um, it's also proposed that the patient gets improved proprioception. You can use conventional fitting techniques. Minor volume changes are readily accommodated. Um, there might be some reduction of temperature, enhanced suspension. Uh, it's usually um, used as a uh, as the first socket so that um, you can accommodate those volume changes. Um, a rigid socket is a material that is not going to be alterable later except maybe like drilling holes in it or shaving it with a sander or something like that. Uh, and these are typically laminated plastic. Laminated plastic means they um, they take uh, um, a fabric uh, and invest it with epoxy resin and um, they put a layer, then there's another layer of that, another layer, and that's what makes it laminated. Um, another is laminated carbon fiber, um, which has, um, it's the same thing they use to make uh, some of those airplanes. Uh, it's a carbon fiber braid uh, that's used during layup and um, it's extremely durable and light. Other terms that I've heard is thermoforming or blister and thermosetting or drape. Now, even prosthetists, like when I talk to them about these words, they're like, ah, don't worry about those. So you might hear the word soft and hard. So that sounds like flexible and rigid, but it's actually different. Uh, soft means that there is a liner or an insert and hard means there isn't one. And so let's talk more about that later. We already kind of talked about the uh, benefits of flexible sockets. Let's talk about liners. So the advantages to having liners is that you get this nice, soft, protective, uh, almost like layer between the um, main socket interface and the patient. And we do this for a lot of the residual limbs, um, mostly the dysvascular patients do really well with this, um, especially if they've got discomfort. Um, it may be that their suspension requires a liner. Uh, the only downsides are that, uh, you know, it's another component, it increases bulk, um, and you may have to do more maintenance with it. And it'll also increase the weight of the prosthesis. Um, the advantages to not having a liner is basically the opposite. Like whatever the disadvantages were, those are the advantages. So this is a good time to talk about the socket shapes. Uh, for the baloney or transtibial, uh, we have essentially um, two types, plug fit or total contact. The plug fit design is not used in the United States anymore, uh, but it's still used in some developing countries. Um, it's basically wood that's hollowed out to approximate the shape of the transtibial limb and at the end of the socket, it's left open. 
Uh, the limb is then inserted into the socket to fill the hole that was created, and much of the weight bearing is distributed through a high lacer, which can be attached to the prosthesis with metal uprights and a single axis hinge. Um, with an open-ended socket design, distal contact is obviously not achieved, and so many problems can arise. And that's why we use, in, um, in America, we use total contact socket shapes. Uh, the, probably the most common you'll hear about is the patellar tendon bearing. Uh, then there's the total surface bearing, which is a little more like a cylinder. And then we have hydrostatic. So for the patellar tendon bearing in general, if you look here, um, there's shading here that shows you that there are pressure sensitive areas. And these are the bony prominences mainly, and posteriorly the hamstrings. Whereas uh, pressure tolerant areas are more like soft tissues, muscles, flat parts of bones. So we're gonna get into a little detail about patellar tendon bearing, total surface bearing, and hydrostatic in later slides. So AK socket shapes, uh, we've pretty much been taught only two main ones, the quadrilateral, which is uh, a bucket, and it's got a wide medial lateral um, diameter, whereas a narrow AP diameter. And what this is, is it's a bucket that the um, amputee sits on. Um, and the distal residual limb, here you can see this, it's kind of just moving around in there and it whips laterally. Eventually, over time, they, develop, they all develop a uh, compensated Trendelenburg gait where they have to move their body weight over it because of this whipping. So the only people who get this quadrilateral socket are, are the ones who had it before and are used to it. Everyone else pretty much gets the ischial containment, which is a narrow medial lateral design. And uh, the uh, ischium actually uh, sits in the socket. So instead of sitting on it, you're sitting in it. So it's grabbing up the gluteals a little bit and it's a snugger fit, there's a bony lock. So another uh, way that you can build a socket is not to have a full socket, but to have a flexible inner socket and a rigid outer frame. So the nice thing about this is that the rigid outer frame is the part that uh, adds weight and this flexible inner socket um, is much lighter. So the whole prosthesis will be a lot lighter because of this. And um, it may be a little more comfortable because this will allow for a little bit of expansion uh, and adapt. Uh, and you can even replace the inner socket if you need to. So we finished talking about sockets. Uh, now we can talk about suspensions. As we said, sockets were the interface and suspension is whatever it is that's keeping the prosthesis on the limb. For above knee suspensions, we have two categories, suction and non-suction. So first let's talk about suction. You can have total suction or partial suction, and then you can use an elastomeric locking liner or hypobaric um, type of suction. Let's go over each of these. Total suction can be wet or dry. So wet suction means you're slathering on this material and then um, you push your uh, stump uh, into the socket and there's a one-way valve on the end and the air is kind of <laughs> farting through that and that's the wet suction. Dry suction would be you put on some kind of nylon or parachute uh, material or a sock and then you pull that out of, you use that to get into the socket and then you pull that out of the um, valve and that's how you get full suction. Partial su suction means that you're using the same kind of systems I just described, but you're putting on some kind of sock or, or nylon, so it can't really be suction, so it's not true suction. You're gonna need some other suspension, some auxiliary suspension. The word elastomeric locking liner means basically gel liner with some kind of locking mechanism. This um, is, a, a, you know, some people call this a pin system. Um, and this has uh, multiple serrations. You could have one that just has one for the locking. Uh, and finally, the hypobaric is where you have this um, seal that's created by the liner. As you can see, here's the liner. And uh, the, this part is what's making contact with the inner socket. And the, the vacuum is created distal to that. So these are the hypobaric systems. 
for non-suction systems, you have basically a leather belt. Um, you can have um, a uh, neoprene type sleeve. This is called a test belt, total elastic suspension. And the other is a pelvic strap and waistband with metal hip joint. These are used for um, very decrepit uh, people. They're kind of heavy. All they're doing is a few transfers here and there. These are great, except that they get really hot. These are uh, grabbing above the condyles. Not condyles, sorry. Uh, the uh, iliac crests. For BK suspensions, we can break them down into two categories, flexible and rigid or anatomic. So flexible would be um, a sleeve suspension, which is over here. So basically like your neoprene sleeve, like the test belt, but for, um, for a BK. So half of it is on the socket and the other half is on the patient. You can use a cuff, which will be um, a supracondylar cuff, which will go above uh, the condyles a locking gel liner, or you can do one of these fork strap waist belt uh, ones. I've seen this once and it was because they wanted to uh, unload the distal uh, limb. So rigid or anatomic versions would be, well, here's your regular PTB, right? It's not, it's going to piston and everything. This guy, the medial and lateral um, walls have been built up. So it's called a supracondylar uh, PTB design. Then if you go all the way around circumferentially, this then becomes a supracondylar suprapatellar design. You can add a thigh corset if you need. So for the foot ankle, basically you can have a solid block of wood and that would be a solid ankle, solid heel. Uh, but we don't do that. The most uh, simple is a solid ankle cushion heel where there's just a little bit of give at the uh, heel. When heel strike occurs, uh, a little bit of deformation of that cushion simulates the same forces that occur when you're plantar flexing in a regular foot. Now with um, a BK, you can get away with a satch foot, but with an AK, you're going to need some actual plantar flexion to stabilize the knee, uh, the prosthetic knee in an AK. So really quick, when we talk about stabilizing the knee, we mean something that promotes extension at the knee. And plantar flexion promotes extension at the knee. Uh, if you add dorsiflexion, then that promotes instability or flexion at the knee. So this is a completely different topic, prosthetic gait deviations, but that should give you just enough to understand that we do want some motion at the ankle in an AK uh, setting. So one thing we can do is put in a, um, uh, a hinge, and that's called a single axis ankle. And then we can put um, various different amounts of um, energy storage, basically uh, something that's going to store potential energy and give it back as kinetic energy. And these are a very varying group of things they can be called a flexible keel. So um, the keel, as in this one, is uh, basically going to be deformed at, as you uh, put pressure on it. And then when uh, the pressure comes off it, it's going to kind of spring back, right, and give you a little bit of plantar flexion. And that's, depending on the materials in there, they're going to have more and more energy stored and given back to you. Knees, well, these can be broken down. This is obviously only in AKs. BKs have their own knees, uh, but let's talk about the different kinds of knees. So you can break down knees into how they give you friction. So you can have mechanical friction or fluid friction. Mechanical friction knees are um, at the most basic, just hinges, right? So you can have a hinge that is um, you know, binary. Basically, it locks or unlocks. So if it's locked, then the person is walking around with a straight knee, you know, no, no motion at the knee. They're going to have a very um, bad looking gait, uh, but they ha also have the most stability at that knee. Uh, then when they want to sit down, they unlock the knee and sit down. And that's a manual locking knee. 
a constant friction single axis knee is basically one um, one uh, hinge uh, which al allows for uh, flexion and extension and then you dial in uh, a certain amount of friction and so the person's going to have uh, one speed of uh, uh, swing uh, and one and one speed that they can do stance in so uh, we'll talk about that in a moment where you can change the cadence of the swing phase and stance phase with fluid friction knees but with the constant friction single axis knee you're getting one cadence polycentric uh, knees are um, pretty cool basically they figured out hey if we put a whole bunch of axes in the in these or four bars or some other version then you can replicate a real knees floating axis of rotation so as you know a real knee does this it's not like a hinge on one axis it's doing this and then that's very different from one single axis a weight activated stance control knee would be for example this one where something is engaging when weight is put through the knee and then so it won't allow for flexion um, and then when you unweigh it then then you can flex right and then extension assist is just adding a little spring in there so that when your knee is um, uh, allowing for extension and swing phase then it gives it a little bit of a, a kick fluid friction knees can either be the two kinds of fluid you can use are uh, air or water if it's pneumatic control you get variability of your swing phase which we couldn't get with our constant friction knees uh, and um, with a hydraulic uh, knee you can get swing and stance variability so this is what you need to memorize microprocessors can be added to knees and ankles nowadays um, to, and you can program them and they can kind of control um, how you're moving whether you're on, when you're on stairs when you're going down uh, inclines declines uh, up and down stairs maybe jumping etc uh, very cool but the computer does add weight and so many people do find these to be unappealing after they start using them because they are so heavy so you have to pick the right candidate for these so um, we finished talking about sockets and suspensions for uh, BKs and AKs um, we talked about knees uh, we talked about ankle feet um, at this point uh, just to talk just to round it out there are some other amputation levels that you're going to see. For example, the ankle disarticulation or SIMS, which has kind of a bulbous distal end. And it's gonna be hard to you know, put this in a traditional socket. So there are different ways to do it. As you can see, there's a window here that they've created and the person puts their limb in through the side and then they seal it up. Um, so this is a SIMS uh, socket. Here's um, another uh, picture showing you three different types of SIMS sockets. One where you're, the opening is on the side, another where there's a window, and another that's just a giant tube. So I promised you I'd talk about uh, hemipelvectomies and hip disarticulations. So, you know, basically these guys need to sit in a bucket and they're not going to be able to ambulate uh, without crutches usually they're going to need either a walker or crutches and you know it's a uh, difficult to get around but they can you know uh sitting in the bucket and then treat them like an ak in terms of the um uh the knee uh the ankle foot uh and the construction uh, one of the more interesting uh amputation levels is the hemicorporectomy where they cut them through the lumbar spine. So I had a colleague uh, who used to perform spinal cord injury um, evaluations um, in, um, I believe in Colorado. And she had a patient drive from Montana um, who had gotten tired of all of the um, sacral decubiti uh, and infections and everything that he had been having all his life. He said, can you just cut half of my body off so I don't have to deal with this anymore. So they admitted him uh, and uh, multiple surgeons were involved. You had to have a, um, 
you had to have someone that could help with the vascular part of things, urinary uh, diversions had to occur, uh, gastrointestinal, etc. So they cut off half his body uh, and uh, they found um, a bucket basically to put him in. This is the kind of prosthesis you would use. Um, and he was very happy with that. Um, there are descriptions in the literature of people um, living like this with or without legs um, and they can they've had gainful employment and and and, and uh, lived very comfortable lives so you never know this one uh, is one of those amputations which is extremely um, functional but may not be performed enough because of you know, people have an ick factor about some of these amputations, such as, for example, the um, Krukenberg, where, you know, you cut through here and you give them like a lobster claw. It's very functional, but people just don't want it. So anyway, the Van Ness ro rotation plasty is when you have um, a good uh, foot ankle, um, but maybe there was a lot of injury of the knee. And so what they do is they rotate the foot and ankle and attach it to the thigh and then the ankle becomes the knee. So this is a board question where they ask you, what does plantar flexion um, become uh, after a Van Ness rotation plasty? And the answer choices are basically either knee flexion or knee extension, and I'll let you think about it. But these are very, um, these are very functional prostheses. Uh, I also thought it was important to show you these stubbies. Uh, someone with a bilateral AK, uh, may not want to put the kind of energy it takes to uh, walk with two uh, AK prostheses. Stubbies are just as functional. Um, they are small, uh, almost like BK um, prostheses that can be worn and you can walk and be very functional like that. They'll be shorter and they have to be okay with that. So, you know, uh, I tried not to make it too complicated, although um, I do have some uh, slides about uh, sockets that I'm that I talked about. I'm going to move them to the end. Uh, but you know, what is your role uh, as a physiatrist uh, when it comes to amputees? When you see the patient and there's a prosthesis in front of you, you might be thinking, "Oh my God, I'm not a prosthetist. What am I going to do?" Well, I would say first thing is. You know, just look at them when they're walking. Are they aligned? You know, do they complain about discomfort? Is it not fitting properly? If they have any questions, you can uh, go over, you know, and educate them about their prosthesis, about amputee management. OGA just stands for observational gait analysis. So definitely watch them walk uh, with or without their uh, assistive devices. You know, talk to them as you would as a physiatrist about all aspects of uh, their life that are affecting function and mobility. Uh, are they uncomfortable with certain cosmetic aspects of it or practical aspects of it? You could be the one to advocate for improving those. And finally, prevention. I think um, one of the greatest uh, pieces of advice that I was given by my mentor as a resident, Dr. Eleanor Annan, was always examine the other foot first because a majority of our patients were dysvascular. So you want to make sure that you're not missing something that's going on with the other foot that happened with the one that got them the amputation in the first place. Um, so you can prevent problems there. You can also prevent problems down the line by talking to them about their diabetes management, their smoking, all of that. As a physiatrist, you have a lot to offer. I, I know this is a tough topic. I know that I probably didn't do the greatest job of... Um, convincing you that it's totally um, learnable. Uh, but um, I hope that by putting some of this stuff in the slides, it's helped you uh, to organize the information for your own learning. Um, yeah, so thank you for your time. Enjoy. I'm including these as bonus slides. Uh, they weren't bonus slides originally, but I think these are pretty advanced topics about sockets. So uh, hoping that these will uh, answer questions that may come up uh, when you're talking to your prosthetist. Uh, I find it interesting, but it might be a little too advanced for you. Enjoy. A, a little advanced, but this is the history of uh, baloney sockets. The first one 
uh, as we said already, is a patellar tendon bearing. Uh, started at University of California, Berkeley in 1957. And um, it's probably the most common, but some people had issues with the fact that um, there would be some pain at the patellar tendon, there'd be um, uh, pistoning, and that it didn't self-suspend or it didn't grab on. So the KBM socket uh, was an improvement because the lateral walls, as you can see here, were brought up higher so that they would uh, grab the uh, lateral uh, and medial condyles and suspend the socket from the stump without auxiliary suspension. The suction socket, although it was there since the 1950s, um, improved the pressure seal during sitting, uh, bending down and athletic activities with less pistoning. In the mid-1980s, the roll-on silicone socket or ice ross was a elastic silicone cone in six sizes that was rolled over the stump as an inner socket and suspension component to provide good total contact with the stump skin. Then you got the total contact suction socket, um, uh, which was using a total surface bearing uh, design uh, where there was maybe pressure distributed over uh, previously considered pressure sensitive areas. And uh, the 3S used the three, uh, TSB design um, to use with along with a silicon uh, liner and um, a shuttle lock. So these, this is kind of <laughs> the progression. If I lost you here, don't worry about it. Just know that uh, this is the sequence and uh, the PTB is the most common and the total surface bearing is probably the next most common, which we'll talk about in the next slide. So the TSB or total surface bearing was an improvement over the patellar tendon bearing um, because it was more comfortable. There was less pistoning during walking um, less skin issues and uh, it didn't get in the way of knee flexion nearly as much. Maybe a little easier to don and doff, but uh, there are some downsides. Uh, people who have uh, issues like, for example, you see here this uh, fibular osteophyte here. Uh, people who have any issues distally, they might not be able to tolerate the total surface bearing as well. This is something you can talk to your uh, uh, prosthetist about what their preferences are, etc. So unfortunately, with both of those, on the um, socket gets in the way of uh, motion when it interacts with the pelvis. So uh, there is there are a couple of uh, options to improve that kind of motion. Uh, these are newer designs. One is the Marlowe Anatomical Socket, or MAS, um, which, as you can see here, this is a typical ischial uh, containment uh, trim line. This one is going f far lower so that uh, your glutes have more range. And as you can see with this woman here, she has no issues uh, getting full flexion out of her hip. Uh, possibly it causes less hip hiking. And I believe that uh, this was designed um, in uh, Guadalajara, Mexico. Uh, but uh, if you talk to a prosthetist, they'll probably know about the MAS socket. Another version uh, that's trying to do that is, as you can see, here's the ischial containment. Here, this one is called the sub-ischial uh, socket design, also known as the Northwestern University Flexible sub Vacuum uh, Socket. Basically, it has no brim, no pelvic interaction, uh, and the trim line is pretty much still right here in the thigh. Um, this is a newer one and uh, your prosthetist may not be uh, using these yet. One military study did show uh, increased sagittal hip range of motion and um, variability in comfort. Um, I had a couple of patients that uh, wanted it and we got them started on it, but I didn't get to follow up with them. So some contraindications here, but uh, at Northwestern, they were able to fit pretty much everyone that came in with this uh, design. Here are some differences between vacuum versus suction. So 